for that very warm welcome. Um, I'm here today and I'll be discussing all about navigating the minefield of changing working relationships when stepping into leadership. So that's a long title for what is sometimes a really complicated situation to be in. I'm really excited to be here today and to share a topic which is incredibly common for those stepping into leadership, but it's not always easy to discuss. Stepping into leadership for the first time is incredibly difficult for so many reasons, and there's added complexity to this situation when we find ourselves leading individuals that used to be our peers. There's a slight change in status that can come with leadership, and we'll be discussing a little bit about that today. So when I was formulating my ideas for this talk, I had some of my own experience in the past, but I kind of thought I was really alone in most of what I had experienced because no one really talks about this topic. So I approached a group of individuals that had kind of made this transition in their career. Some had made them recently, some not so recently, and I approached them and I asked them, hey, I wanna address a topic about engineering leadership, specifically for new engineering leaders, but I'm not sure how much this resonates with others. And the topic is all around how your relationships will change with your peers when you step into leadership. And the response I got from everyone was unanimous, ah. So if you are in this situation, then take some comfort in the fact that you're not alone. So we're all part of the engineering leadership community, but this talk is aimed for lots of us. So specifically, if you're thinking about transitioning into your first leadership role, or if you're new into your leadership role, and you might be seeing signs of what I'll be speaking about today, it's also incredibly important for those who are helping others into leadership roles. So for example, if you're a engineering leader already and you're trying to coach someone else, it's really important for you to recognize that these are some of the barriers that people do face when trying to step into leadership. On the other hand, if you are not interested in engineering leadership at all and you're wondering what you're doing here, um, there might be some top tips that you can take and just understand what it's like from the other side if you'll be led by your peer in the future. So we all wear lots of different leadership hats sometimes, but specifically what I'll be talking about today is those leadership positions where you're responsible for other engineers. So whether that's a tech lead, a engineering team lead, or an engineering manager. Before I dive in, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Hamira, and I'm currently a senior software engineer at Accurex. Accurex is a London-based health tech startup, and we're looking to solve some of the biggest problems that the NHS faces and by enabling everyone who's involved in a patient's care to communicate with each other, and that does include the patient as well. Before my time at Accurex, I spent some time in engineering leadership in corporate performance management and financial reporting, where I kind of built my career and moved into engineering leadership in those industries. Accurex is a sponsor of today's event, and we are hiring lots of different roles, so if you're interested in hearing about what we're doing, um, come visit the booth outside. So engineering leadership is a really exciting step for most of, our, uh, most of us, um, but it's a role that our engineering roles in the past haven't really always prepared us for. We have to lean into lots of different skills when it comes to engineering leadership. So we've built these technical skills in the past and some of the problem solving skills in the past as well, but there's lots of new skills that we have to develop quite rapidly, and that means that we have to build a lot of new relationships as well. There's a book by Michael Watkins called The First 90 Days. And this book is all about how to make that leadership transition. So whether you're in the same company and it's your first leadership role or you're transitioning from one company to another, um, and it could be your first leadership role, it could be your hundredth leadership role, but it's all about those career transitions and how to make the first 90 days really, really successful. So there's a quote from Michael Watkins where he says, if you take a typical group of mid-level executives and ask if they've ever been promoted to lead their peers, 90% of them will say yes. So this can seem a little bit obvious because we all want to work in a place where we do see some kind of a career growth and some potential for what we can do in the future. But to me, this quote means that this is an incredibly common situation to be in. And there will be times where a lot of us do have to adjust our working relationships with our peers. So again, if you are going through this at the moment, or you fear that you might, take some comfort in the fact that you are really not alone, even if it really feels like it right now. Stepping into engineering leadership means our roles will slightly change. So as an engineer, as a contributor, we're often focused on our own deliverables. 
So we might have some focus on what other people are doing in our team. So we might have like a shared goal. We might see what they're doing in stand-up, so when they give their stand-up updates. But when we move into engineering leadership, we switch from being a contributor to a multiplier. So it's up to us to boost the outcomes of our teams. And that means that we have to cultivate the environments that will boost the outcomes of our teams. That means that those less developed skills that I mentioned previously, we really have to start leaning into those. For example, if you become a tech lead, you're now becoming the advocate of the technical solutions that your team are now solving. With this influence over the technical vision, the technical direction, and also the technical strategy, we have this responsibility within our organizations to ensure that our team is aligned with the organization's general focus. So there's this concept of vector alignment, and as we're all engineers, I'm sure we all love maths. So if I could cast your mind back to school, a vector has both a magnitude, but it also has a direction. So if you think of all individuals within an organization representing a vector, in order for that organization's goals, missions to be reached, every vector needs to be moving at the same direction at roughly the same pace. Bruce Tuckman has explained the formation of high-performance teams in five stages. So quickly, the first stage is forming. So that's when individuals come together in a team. They're quite curious about what the project will entail and kind of why they all have been brought into this team. But people might not really know each other. They might not really understand how they're going to all work together. Teams will then go through a storming stage. So this is where individuals slightly push against each other's boundaries. People aren't really on their best behavior anymore, and there can be some clashes in the way that people work with each other. Teams will then go through a norming stage. So this is when eventually people have resolved their differences. They're not at their most optimum yet in terms of how a team works, but they're kind of looking towards a better future. Teams will then go through the performing state, which is the best state to be in. And that's when you're achieving your goals and you're quite efficient in how you're achieving those as well. If the project comes to an end or the team kind of isn't needed anymore, or the team splits, for example, then teams will go through an adjoining stage. So this stage um, is generally quite happy, um, but the project has been successful, um, and then the team, for example, will then be disbanded. However, some individuals can find that change quite difficult to navigate through. The forming and the storming stages can happen when anything in your team, in your team changes, including a change in engineering leadership. And it's important that we keep those stages in check, because if things go drastically wrong in those stages, there could be a challenge to leadership. Individuals can come really disillusioned with what the, the mission is of the company or even the project that the, the team is working on. And this can lead to a lot of confrontation and tensions, which is something that we really do want to avoid. But these stages are really important to go through. And eventually, you will get to that norming and that performing state, which is a much happier place to be in. Some are going to look to you for direction as an engineering leader. And this can be difficult, especially if you're a first-time engineering leader and it's your first time doing all of this stuff. New leaders are responsible for navigating the team through those difficult stages and ensuring that that vector they alone, so that's both vector of us as individuals, but also the team that we're responsible for, are aligned with the wider business. And that's why relationships between engineering leaders and their teams are so incredibly important. So being an engineering leader is a really exciting step in your career. So you develop these practical skills as an engineer. You've started maybe working on bugs and features in your early stages of your career. And then you've moved on and worked on smaller systems and larger systems and more, more complex systems. And then when you become an engineering leader, you are working with the most complex system of them all. And that is people. So teams are made of people and Teams need motivating, and they need unblocking, and they need rewarding, and there's all sorts of needs that we bring to the workplace. Our jobs are to produce outcomes. So in, in whichever leadership position you're taking, this could be to deliver high-quality technical solutions. This could be the general health of your team. You're looking at your objectives and their outcomes, and generally just a consistent execution of whatever results are within your team that individuals are looking for. People, process, and tools are key to get the best results and the best outcomes. So this means within your team, you need that mutual respect and to maximize the team's morale and effectiveness. Every individual comes to work with their own motivations, and they bring those motivations with them into the, in their day-to-day -day work, just as I bring my own motivations in my day-to-day -day work, and I'm sure all of you do as well. 
Getting to a stage where those results within your team are optimized is definitely not an overnight process. It's going to take lots of small incremental steps, and you'll be working alongside your teams to get there. So the initial transition. So building a rapport with your team prior to an announcement is incredibly important, and this can really help to pave, pave the way for a, a smooth, successful, and easy transition. But if this is an unexpected step in your career, then that's also OK. So myself, I first found myself in an engineering leadership role when I came back from annual leave, and I was told by my manager that last week there was an announcement, and I was now the engineering lead of the team. <laughs> right. So this can happen, and I'm, I think in our industry, this actually happens quite a lot. Sometimes there's a gap, and it needs to be filled. Um, and me, I found it quite a good challenge, and I was quite excited about the opportunity, and so I was happy to take it. So that means that I didn't have that initial smoothing in period with my team, though. So the first thing I would say is to focus on the people. So historically, as an engineer, people has always been someone else's responsibility. So whether it's the lead that was there or an engineering manager, it's, quite, it's their responsibility. But whichever form of leadership you're now taking, people is now your responsibility. So in those early stages, create a space for your team to voice their concerns, their pain points, and this will give you a few ideas on what those early wins can be within your team. So have a goal. For example, depending on the size of your team, you might want to aim to set up a one-to-one -one with every individual within your team by the end of the first week. When you're thinking of these early wins, it can be really easy to kind of pick your own based on the experience that you've had. So for me, when I first stepped into engineering leadership, I thought, yes, finally, all those things that have been bugging me, I'm now in a position where I can choose to fix them. This is not the way that you want to do things. Um, both your team, your peers, but also your manager will have an idea of kind of the expectations that they have and the improvements that they want to see. So pick something small that there's some generally some consensus with that needs to be improved and help correct it. And then give praise to your team for their openness to want to improve things and also the actions that they've taken to improve those things as well. As a new leader, you might be really tempted to take all of the credit for these improvements, and this can be incredibly demotivating for your team. So this, I'm sure this has happened to lots of people here, but this has happened to me where I've been on the other side. I put all of this work into improving some process, and I've got no credit for it. So treating your team with respect for their efforts is going to pay dividends for you in the future. And actually, as an engineering leader, by making your team look good, naturally, you're going to look good yourself as well. So establishing new ways of working, both between you and individuals within your team, but also your team as a whole, is really important. Every individual is different, so we all bring something new to the table, whether that's our strengths, our weaknesses, and also experiences we've had in the past and how we've worked with other people. Understanding ways of working will clarify how your team dynamic is going to work and how you're going to work alongside the rest of your team, but also how you see each other's roles. So this means if there's any misalignment of the expectation of your role as an engineering leader, this is the time to iron those out. It's really important when discussing ways of working to keep your team as engaged as possible. So you want to come away with a solid understanding of connection, of belonging, and momentum. So you, people need to understand why, that, why we're in the team, what the project is we're working on, and also the cadence. So what meetings are we going to need? How often are we going to need them? Things like code reviews, how quick are we going to action them? When can people expect responses? And those kind of things. And that's really going to cement the momentum of your team as well. While making this initial transition, feedback is incredibly important as well. So there are lots of existing models on how to get feedback when you've worked alongside individuals for quite a while. So that could be a period of weeks, a period of months. But when you're a new leader, the earlier you get feedback, the easier it's going to be to have those conversations about establishing new ways of working. But how can you get feedback when you've not really had a chance to work with individuals yet? So the type of feedback you want from people are just how they, they see the team working in general. So questions like, what do you hope stays the same? What do you hope improves? Questions in general that are going to cement that you really want to create a positive working environment within your team. Beyond this initial transition, there are some really tricky situations that can happen when you're leading your former peers. So you might find yourselves going through some of these situations and wondering, when is this ever going to end? Some of these things might even seem a bit personal, and unfortunately, a lot of these things do happen to those who are underrepresented and marginalized within the engineering community. So you might find yourself in one of these situations, or if you're really unlucky, you might find yourselves in all of these situations. 
So firstly, your leading former peers, and as part of your movement into leadership, they may have provided you with some glowing feedback. You might have had some really strong friendships with them before, and now you're wondering, are we still allowed to be friends? Stories that I've heard from other people are not really knowing, do people still want to have lunch with me? Um, am I still allowed to have lunch with them? My own experience is kind of approaching a water cooler conversation, and as I was approaching, it kind of died down, and my mind wondered, are they talking about me, or are they talking about one of my peers? Um, so yes, they may have been talking about me, they may have been talking about one of my peers. Um, but yes, of course, you can still definitely continue these friendships. But there needs to be an understanding of what your new responsibilities are as an engineering leader. And that's going to be key to, to handling this transition. Remember, you change from a contributor to a multiplier. So you need to be scrupulously fair with all of your team, regardless of who they are and friendships that you may or may not have had with them. Not doing so is going to really undermine your leadership and lead to a decline in that multiplier effect, which is so important for your team. If you're perceived to have favorites, so whether that's actual favorites or apparent favorites, that's going to be a big warning sign that there has been some serious miscommunication within the team. So with these relationships, it's best to recalibrate the, specifically the working parts of these relationships quite early on in one-to-ones and deal with any awkwardness head on and try not let it, let it prolong weeks and months because that's just going to make your role all that harder. Explain how you see your roles changing. You want to make sure there's no ambiguities on what your responsibilities are. Be clear that friendships aside, there are going to be moments where you do disagree, where you might have to have difficult conversations about performance, but you'd still appreciate their support. Be quite direct about how you want to navigate the more trickier moments when there are conflict, conflicts between you and, and the relationships that you have within your team. When these situations do arise, and they will arise, it's imperative that the agreed plan is honoured whenever, whenever, whenever any of these situations do happen. Having difficult conversations is part and parcel of being a leader in general, but an engineering leader as well. It's impossible to please everyone, and especially it's impossible to please engineers. Sometimes we get shiny new toy syndrome, where we want to try out the latest and the greatest technology, but there might not really be a business need to be able to do so. Most engineers want to create something really reusable, but then a lot of engineers never really want to reuse anything. Right. So, yeah, so these are the kind of conversations you might have to navigate within your team now. You might have to make decisions that the team doesn't really agree with. There might be some really uncertain outcomes of, of certain situations that are external to your team, decisions that you actually yourself disagree with, but you kind of have to make sure that the team is still moving forward. So, again, if I refer back to that concept of vector alignment, despite what's happening outside your team or even within your team, you kind of need to make sure that the team is still moving ahead and still aligned with the general direction of the wider organization. As a new engineering leader, when you hear opposing views, which is something that you said or something that's happening, you might think that this is a really awful position to be in. However, if your team are showing signs of engagement by opening up and saying what their concerns are, this is actually a really good sign that your team do find this environment to be um, trusting and that they are open to be able to have those conversations within the team. So if you are making decisions and you're finding that there are a lot of pushback, challenge your own decisions as well. Again, as engineering leaders, it's not up to us to have all the answers, but it's up to us to find all the answers. Make sure that you've not fallen into a trap of picking favorites and let that influence some of your decisions. What you do want to make sure is that the team is being treated with respect. Everyone feels like they're being listened to. You, you're probably not going to be able to validate every single person's idea, but you should aim to validate the individuals themselves. Make sure that they're still aligned to the team and that they don't feel alienated for having a view that others do disagree with. A lack of alignment can happen within teams if people don't have the content, so they won't know what the decisions are that have been made, but they also don't really know what the, the context behind those decisions are. So if folks have raised concerns, Firstly, it thanks them for their transparency that they have raised a concern because this is going to encourage them to continue doing that in the future. 
But you have this leadership card that you sometimes get when it comes to uh, leadership in general, specifically engineering le um, leadership. But using that leadership card to kind of override, override decisions and make sure that, um, that people that aren't really happy with your decisions, but you're still going to push that forward anyway, the use of that leadership card should be the exception and definitely not the rule. If you're finding this is happening often, it's likely a symptom of a, another problem. For example, people might have a lack of context behind behind what the decision is and why was it made. There could be a lack of, line, lack of alignment in general. People might not really understand what the technical strategy and direction is and they're wondering why this decision was made. So I would fix this by clarifying the, the elements that have gone into that decision. So I've, I've listed some here which are, are quite relevant to engineering decisions. So you might have context of the cost, the benefits, time, risk, data, what the problem is your team's trying to solve, the team expertise, and just generally the quality um, of the solutions that are available. If you clarify all of these elements within your team, everyone is going to understand why a decision was made. It will then become less of a puzzle for your team to try and solve and understand what has happened and why has it happened. Generally speaking, in a team where a lot of these elements are well understood, voting for what a decision should be can generally yield some similar outcomes. Just understand that people might have some external conflicting motivations and this might not always be the case. This one is an extra awkward point. So, you may have found yourself in a position where you're not the only one up for this promotion, but you're the only one who's got it. So in the past, you may have been on the other side of this, but now you're on the other side of this, for example, where you are now, you have now been chosen to be the leader. This can happen increasingly in leadership positions. So whether it's your first or whether it's your 10th, you can see that as an engineer, if you have two mid-level engineers and they're both reaching the expectations of a senior engineer, it's generally a little bit easier to kind of have that conversation and promote both of them into those roles. But leadership roles in general, just by the nature of them, are fewer in number. And so decisions have to be made on who, who is going to have that role. Everyone comes to work with their own motivations and their aspirations, their one-year plans and their five-year plans. And so for the other party, this can be incredibly disheartening and disappointing. It's an incredibly delicate situation to be in, but it's important to understand that you, as a leader who has been chosen and given this promotion, you have every right to be proud of your accomplishments. So don't let anyone take that away from you. Saying that, you want to approach both celebrating this and apologizing it about it very carefully. On one hand, you don't want to cause any more hurt feelings, and on the other hand, you don't want to give anyone any reason to doubt your ability to do this job. So this situation can manifest itself in lots of different ways. So ideally, and this would be the best way, uh, it could be nothing at all, and it just takes the other individual a little bit of time to absorb this news and move on. A step up from that is when the unhelpful and harmful behaviours can start. So you might start hearing sarcastic comments. Someone might say to you, well, you're the boss, in, in a way that suggests that you're not the boss. You might have a lot of eye rolling when you're, when you're saying things to your team. And a level up even from that is that harmful gossip can start to be spread as well. So these more harmful behaviours definitely need to be addressed. And I would recommend anyone who's um, training someone into that leadership position to keep an eye out for these kind of things because while it's not part of a core responsibility it can definitely impact that individuals to do their new role. If you are going through this understand it's not really about you so try not to take it personally even though it really feels like it's a personal thing in that moment. Be quite direct with this individual, try to come up with a way to move forward. So think about what are they good at, what can they bring to the table, what's going to help next time that there's a round of promotions and, and they're able to kind of um, fight, make their case. Try to give them projects that are going to help, help them as well. Saying that, you don't want to give all of that time to this individual and let it stop you from doing the job at hand. People have seen some potential in you and you've shown an ability to do this role and that's why you've been put in this situation. So don't, come distract, don't, don't become distracted uh, from the job at hand and try to find opportunities for an individual to constantly train up. So I myself have been in this situation and I gave lots of opportunities to an individual, technologies that they wanted to learn, tasks that they had a preference for, lots of different things. 
In the end, I didn't end up winning that individual and they, kind of, they chose to leave the organization. But what I found myself over a period of weeks was trying to basically bend over backwards, trying to make this person happy. And it, it, was, it, was, at, it was a risk that I was gonna get distracted from my job by doing this. And it was also unfair to the other engineers who may have also wanted to learn those technologies and to bring something to the table as well. So transitioning into engineering leadership for the first time, you can find quite suddenly a lot of our important work isn't the work that we traditionally do at our desks. But it's going to be in those relationships that we're building, especially in those early stages. Your feedback loops become a lot looser than what they used to be as an engineer. Sometimes you can put something out and it's now going to take you weeks, even months to see a result. You're no longer working alongside your peers daily. You might see them once a week or maybe a few times a month. So this transition can sometimes be a little bit lonely as well. So it's really important from day one that you protect your boundaries. Be quite upfront in your ways of working about what can and what can't work for you and that you're not overdoing and overburdening yourself as a new leader. You will definitely want to vent at some point, but be careful about venting, specifically the timing, the audience and the location as well. If I could give the biggest tip about looking after yourself as a new leader is to find your support networks. So if you do work at a larger organization and there are other engineering leaders, form your support network there, or we are lucky enough to be here today where we have lots of engineering leaders, which are also your support networks. So open up these conversations and make sure that we're all helping out each other as well. So my final thoughts, hopefully if you are not yet an engineering leader, I have not completely put you off. I found engineering and engineering leadership to be incredibly rewarding. Not only do you get to work with some incredible teams of really talented individuals, you learn from their talents and from their skills as well, and you get to sh share those celebrations when things are going very well. For example, if you're stepping into a technical lead role, you might find those technical challenges are even greater than the ones you've had as an engineer in the past. Getting past those forming and those storming steps are so vital to experience all of the incredible things that you do within a team. So, some, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. Firstly, recalibrate your working relationships. Start small, collect feedback to establish your credibility and find your new tribe and your new support network. Your new peers within engineering leadership are all here for you and you are definitely not alone. Come and find me at the Accurate stand or somewhere around if you wanna discuss any of this further and I'll be in the office hours in the break. I would honestly love to hear from you and your experiences too. And that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening.